Okay. Greetings, everyone. Happy to be here with you. It's been a while since I've done a fresh YouTube broadcast, but I think now you know the reason why. I've been spending the last few months on a project that has taken all of my time and energy, and that is writing a new book. So I want to talk about that book here. Um, and I was kind of mapping out my notes here. I don't think this is going to be one of the longer uh, Richard Olin shows that I do, maybe a half hour, maybe a little bit longer. So I'm just letting you know in advance here. Um, anyway, writing this book was an unexpected development, but it was something that grew out of an online lecture that I gave last June, uh, which I called uh, an executive briefing on the alien agendas. That was a 90 minute talk in which I discussed really for the first time for me in any detail, what I thought to be the most likely scenarios of the alien presence here in our world. From that talk, I decided that I might want to do like a short booklet, you know, publish a short book based on that. And from a 90 minute lecture that might translate into like 65 pages or something like that. And that was my original intention. The thing is this, every time I sat down to work on that project, I realized that there was so much more I wanted to say. So the project just kept growing went past 100 pages and it went past 150 pages. And then eventually it came to 245 pages. So it's not a massive volume, but it's not a booklet. Uh, I'll show you a picture of it. The title of the book is, uh, let's see, there we go. The Alien Agendas and Analytical Speculation of Those Visiting Earth. Uh, we actually would have had the book out a little earlier, but we were waiting on the cover. Definitely happy with the cover artist. Uh, you guys can thank Tracy for organizing that part of it, by the way. Uh, she rounded everyone up and made made this happen. Uh, I like the eye in the background. I think it's kind of got a cool, cool look to it. So uh, the thing is, I'm not in a good position to judge the merits or flaws of this book. Honestly, I think it's hard for an author to be objective about their work. That's That's going to be up to readers to decide. That'll be up for you to decide if you choose to read the book. But I can tell you what I tried to do. Let me take this off here. Um, first, I worked very hard to gather the best evidence of what is probably the most difficult phenomenon that I can think of, and that's encounter cases of people with alleged or apparent non-human entities. So that means alien abduction cases and all other types of encounters. And we all know that this is a tricky area, to say the least, it's a tricky area. So for that reason, and for a long time, I tried to avoid getting too deep into this topic, into what I thought the aliens were, what they were trying to do, and on and on. It's like, like I couldn't avoid it, but I also really didn't want to go deep into it. I mean, for me, I've always been a believer in sticking closely to verified facts in my writing, as any of you who have followed me, you know this. But here's the thing, there's always a need and there's always a place for analysis that includes extrapolation and some speculation. I think that's totally valid, especially in an area like UFOs and potentially aliens, in which so much information simply is not available to us. Even now, after all these years, we're just still missing so much that we want to have. So we need to speculate if we really want to create a viable picture of what is going on, a scenario that makes sense based on the best evidence also that is available to us, all of those things. Now, for most of UFO research, even through history, and that definitely includes current UFO research, most people, I would say, still avoid getting into those deep waters. And understandably so, to be honest. There's a tremendous amount of information you have to wade through. And, and then the most difficult thing, which is to put yourself out there and tell other people what you think, knowing full well that you are very likely to be wrong on any number of aspects of your argument. So that was my thought going into this. Like, I'm sure that some of the things that I think may be true may not be true. And that's just the name of the game. Even so, I'm very glad I wrote this book. One thing that I do feel confident to say is that it's, I think it's a good read. 
And I also think it's an interesting book. I will say that the ideas and themes in it, they definitely fascinate me. And that is why I wrote about them. I tried my best to make this an engaging read for everybody. That means newcomers to ufology, and that means the old timers who've been in the game for many years. I think it's a fresh book. And honestly, that is my number one goal at all times. Well, no, I want it to be an accurate book, but I want it to be a fresh book also. So let me talk a little bit about the book itself. Um, what I've tried to do is identify what types of beings that people encounter, what the capabilities of those beings appear to be, how long they seem to have been here, and why they are here. And also, to the extent possible, what are their relationships to each other? That is, what are their goals, if any? Uh, are there good guys and bad guys out there? And if so, can we identify them? Is there a long range plan? All of these types of questions. So to do that, the first thing I tried to do was to take the long view of the interactions that people seem to have been having with these beings over many, many years going back into ancient times. After all, if one or more group has been interacting with us for a long time, that might speak a lot toward their uh, relationship to us. So toward that end, I actually start the book by examining a little known and definitely controversial claim that our genetics, that is human beings' genetics, were tampered with and essentially enhanced or modified roughly 40,000 years ago. Now, this is based on the evidence of something known as the D allele of a gene called the microcephalin gene. And this is a gene that controls much of human brain development. Geneticists uh, all seem to agree that we obtained this allele quite recently in our past. They can only give a range at this point, and it's roughly on the low end of like 15,000 years, maybe 20,000 years on the low side, and up to about 60,000 years on the high side. Generally, you hear them splitting the difference and coming to 37.5 thousand years, which is right down the middle of their estimate. But it could be 30,000. It could be 45,000. You get the idea. So one thing about this allele, the geneticists all agree that our species acquired it from an outside source, from an external source. So that is, it came through interbreeding. Now, I don't know how or why they argue this, but that seems to be a settled issue for them, so okay. The question then is, who's the daddy? So most people would assume it's the Neanderthal, since it's well known that human beings did interbreed with Neanderthals during that period of time. It's a reasonable assumption, except for one thing. We have had access to Neanderthal DNA for a while now, and there are actually quite a few uh, samples of it that are well-preserved. Specialists have been looking specifically for this gene and this allele, and the fact is it doesn't seem to be there, and it's not for lack of them trying. They have been trying. I've read a number of the studies about this. So now maybe, maybe it is there, maybe one day in 10 years or 20 years from now, maybe they'll find it, but there's a good chance they won't. There's been very thorough searching so far and there's no luck. Um, there actually was another human species around back then, a group known as the Den Denisovans. Uh, they were very closely related to Neanderthals. They looked a lot like them, very minor differences, but they're specifically separate genetically. And we have a little bit less we have quite a lot less data on them. But similarly, there's no DNA connection to this gene or allele that's been found. And the studies linking that to Denise events have been very, uh, like the scientists basically said, it doesn't look like it's there. <laughs> so now I'm mentioning all of this in a book on the alien agenda is why? Because the obvious possible conclusion is that if it wasn't the Neanderthals and it wasn't the Denise events, then we, we've got this from some external source. And the question that I'm asking is, could that source be extraterrestrial? I realize that is a stretch for many people. Okay, I understand that. Believe me, I do. I've been in the UFO field for 25 years. You get to pick up on a few things, like some people don't think that this is a very 
uh, sane topic to be talking about and that these are crazy conclusions. I understand that. However, uh, could it be that is an extraterrestrial solution to this? And I will have to say, absolutely, why not? Now, I don't know that, but I think it's a genuine possibility. To support this theory, I look at the spread of things like uh, sky god myths in human history and also brought forth some other connections that I believe strengthen this contention. Um, one of them is the creative explosion that took place in our species around 40,000 years ago. I mean, certainly what we see at around that time is an exponential growth in human artistic genius, as well as in innovations and tool making and a lot more. So something clearly switched on with our species at around that time. Okay, so that's all I got to say on that whole thing. There's more in the book, but I'm just gonna leave that here for now. Let's move on. The thing, the reason I brought this up is if, if we are someone's project, like if there was some hypothetical extraterrestrial species that looked at us those thousands of years ago and said, close, but not quite there, let's tweak them a little bit. Boom, here we go. Is that a possibility? If it is, then we might be somebody's project. You know, in the line of what, uh, Charles Ford about 100 years ago wrote, he said, I think we're property. Maybe that's true, or maybe we're someone's project. Um, if that is so, all right, someone who decided that we would benefit from a genetic tweak, then what do we have to say about all the beings that uh, people have been interacting with over the years? So I, let's start looking at that. I began by looking at encounters that people have had with completely human looking entities. Um, or I should say entities that look human or looked human, but somehow or another didn't seem entirely human. So anyone who has studied this area knows that there are many such accounts like this. Um, and they go back for thousands of years. And as a matter of fact, we've got some very, very interesting written accounts that go back at least several centuries. I have included uh, several of those accounts in my book. None of those beings, it's very interesting to say, come across as hostile. Um, those types of encounters, the beings really come across mostly as standoffish, but they do seem to have, to have had an occasional interest in monitoring the activities of our ancestors and very occasionally interacting with them. So combined with enough of good quality observations of UFO activity in ancient times, my conclusion is that at least one significant group has been here for a very long time. Now, there are many UFO sightings in the past that don't necessarily stack up to being all that much to get excited about, but there are enough of them that actually are that are quite interesting and quite compelling. So for that reason, I, I think that that's the conclusion I come to. There's been at least one group that has been here for a long, long time. Now, one question that I asked myself, and I'm sure you are asking at some point, is why would they look human? Why would any aliens look human? This is something that's really bugged me for a long time, and I've thought about it. Um, and I've developed some thoughts on this that I put into this book. Um, most of that I can leave to readers of the book. You can follow my argument there. But suffice to say that my best guess at this time is that some of our ancestors may very well have been taken or, let's say, adopted by some other advanced group and essentially brought to, a, to that culture, to a completely different culture, a completely different society and raised in that manner. That's one theory. And when I look over uh, encounters that people have had in recent times with human looking occupants of these craft, and there are quite a few of them, uh, it becomes quite evident that those humans are very, very different from us, even though they may look very much like us. There's a very different culture going on there. So I think that's one theory. Another theory, why, why would it, any aliens supposedly look human is that whoever these beings were, they could make themselves look human, right? Through uh, various illusions. Uh, you certainly hear stories of gray aliens, and I'm gonna get to them in a minute, uh, creating illusions in their appearance and, and visual illusions of different types. So maybe, and this is just a hypothesis, maybe that's what these other beings are doing. They're not actually human, but they made themselves look human. Okay. Um, or maybe, 
that they actually are somehow human looking for reasons that are not clear to me that I, I wouldn't understand why a species in another uh, star system would have species that evolved to look that closely like us. Uh, certainly the basic body plan, I think we can assume uh, among successful technological organisms might actually look a lot like ours. It's totally possible. Two arms, two legs, very handy. Eyes, you know, five, six feet above the ground, very useful, having them forward looking, all of that. Um, it's very probable, in my opinion, that successful species elsewhere probably would develop a body plan, maybe not that different than what we have here. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't sh shock me in the least to find that there are humanoid uh, aliens throughout the universe. Um, and maybe some of them look very close to us after all, I don't know. Uh, my best guess if I were to take would be the first of my um, theories, which is that probably some of us, our ancestors in the ancient past were actually scooped up, taken, tweaked, and that's their, that's their world now. But that may be something we never know the answer to. It's just my best theory at this time. Now, however that may be, the evidence in my view is that the presence of these beings over a long, long period of time took place, um, let's say at a very low level. In other words, uh, I don't wanna say a fully hands-off monitoring, but I, I do not personally see any significant evidence at all that we've been interfered with in our history. This is my conclusion. Other people may feel differently, but I do think that we've been monitored at a low level for a long, long time kind of like an observation monitoring sort of a thing. That is until something very important happened, until our civilization went through a major transformation. And this transformation, which we are going through right now, has gotten the attention, in my opinion, of other groups. I mean, after all, in the last century, human civilization has completely transformed itself. You know, we are now moving towards something that I've been calling the fourth stage of humanity. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because it's relevant for this topic here. What I mean by the fourth stage of humanity is that for all of our prior history, human beings have existed basically in three fundamental forms of society. Yes, there's been lots of variations, but the basic forms have been three, three types. First, there was hunting and gathering which lasted for hundreds of thousands of years. And then about 10 to 15,000 years ago, we began um, our first transformation to what I would call our second stage of existence. And that is the transformation to settled agriculture, sedentary agriculture, the agricultural revolution. Um, this gave us our first cities, it gave us writing, it gave us the wheel, it gave us all the other inventions and developments of civilization. It gave us the Roman empire and it gave us all other human societies as well. It was quite a huge transformation, right? And that was our level for all the time since until about roughly 300 years ago or so. Uh, you know, and all of these don't happen overnight, obviously they're a bit gradual, but that's when we went through our next transformation to what I call the third stage. And that is our world dominated by science and industry. So you're talking the scientific revolution and, and then followed not long after by the industrial revolution. And those changed our world just as radically as did the previous agricultural revolution. And, and this is when things really started picking up in speed where our society really started transforming more rapidly. So by a little more than a century ago, let's say the turn of the 20th century, I mean, people were developing serious technology by this point, you know, from railroads to telegraph, to the car, to the telephone, to airplanes, to electronics and powerful weapons like the atomic bomb and transistors and computers and space travel, <laughs> the internet, <laughs> smartphones, and now, and now we are on the cusp of strong artificial intelligence um, and genetic engineering and really the digitization of our entire world uh, and, and a lot more. And I, you know, 
I'll just interject here. If some of you are wondering, like, well, why aren't you talking about this? I actually am talking about this all the time on my website. Uh, I haven't been as active here on YouTube, but I am very active on my site over at richardolanmembers.com, or I do weekly uh, video podcasts and audio uh, file, uh, audio creations and articles. I do that all the time over there. So I'm talking a lot about the fourth stage of humanity and, and this transformation that we are going through. And it is an... Um, it's an absolutely tremendous. Like I think people are are kind of getting it now, and you hear people talking about the Great Reset, and I think yes, that is part of this, absolutely part of this. Um, but this is even bigger than that. What I'm talking about. So um, now, because we are experiencing our next major transformation, uh, the fourth stage of humanity. Humanity. So what is that? It's a transformation unlike anything that we have ever ever been able to think about before. It includes not just strong artificial intelligence, not just uh, genetic engineering, but it includes universal 5G technology and smart devices that are, uh, unfortunately from us, ending all traditional notions of privacy. This is something I've talked about here in the past, uh, but also it just includes much, much more. And while it it threatens to take power away from individuals in all sorts of ways. It also is very likely going to give the human race as a whole tremendous power to do things it has never been able to do before. So I believe that this is why our development our, as a civilization has gotten the attention of anyone in our galactic neighborhood who has the ability to check us out. I think that is the main reason why the world during the 20th century experienced far, far greater numbers of UFO sightings and claims of alien encounters than ever before in our history. Yes, the advent of atomic weapons was clearly a signifier, but what I'm suggesting is these rapid developments in technology are like signposts towards something even bigger, and that is this transformation that I'm talking about. So it may be that part of that jump in sightings that you know happened in the 20th century, uh, maybe part of that was caused by our greater ability to detect them. I think that's probably part of the answer. But I also believe that the biggest reason is simply because they were coming here in much greater numbers. That's it. We got their attention. Now, even though throughout our long history, People saw what we would call UFOs, and and they also encountered beings, um, or I guess I should say claimed that they encountered beings that were not from here. It was really only during the 20th century that this really happened in the sense of non-human looking beings, that is, aliens. Um, it's true, like there were sightings of so-called fairies and little people and things like that, so um, I shouldn't make it a full blanket statement like that. But I'm talking about the types of aliens that people report uh, nowadays. That includes beings we call the greys, right? And it also includes other types of beings that are sometimes overlooked that people have described. Uh, other humanoid beings that are short, but not the greys, uh, sometimes described in various crash retrieval accounts. I discuss this in the book as well. It also includes taller entities and it includes beings that look like other species on Earth, like insect-like beings or reptilian type beings, type beings, and others uh, still that look sort of human but not quite human. So when you go through these reports, uh, as I have gone through them in preparing this book, uh, you have to allow for a, a substantial amount of error on the part of witnesses. I think that's just inevitable. But the thing is, there's been a tremendous amount of consistency with the basics. My view, something definitely is going on um, regarding other types of beings that are here. Now, these other types of beings do not all act the same. One group has consistently been linked to the phenomenon of, of abductions, and that is the greys, of course. I spent a fair amount of space in the book analyzing the greys and what they appear to be up to. There is clearly a covert operation going on. And in the book, I make the case that this operation is known to at least some of the human elite that has power today. And also I make the case that this elite is powerless over what has gone 
going on, or at least they feel that they are powerless to do anything about it. And that is one big reason for secrecy on their part. Part. It's not the only reason, but it is a big reason. I don't think that they are able to stop this. Um, and if they were to out the whole thing to the rest of the world, I don't think that they are confident that they could deal with it effectively, even under those conditions. And I think that's why they're not. That is one reason why they're not saying anything. I also think, um, and I wrote in this book, that the abduction program, I think, is going on for multiple reasons. It's not just, I mean, the main reason everyone talks about is the creation of uh, a genetic hybrid species, one that looks human while still possessing critical qualities that the greys have, and also their allies. If uh, you believe that the insect and insectolin type beings are their allies, which I think I think uh, Dave J J David Jacobs is probably right on this, and that the insectolin type beings are really running the show in the background. Uh, I think that's a reasonable hypothesis. But anyway, the point of these hybrids is that they look human, but they have certain qualities that these other beings also have. One of those qualities uh, is some form of telepathy, or if you don't want to use the word telepathy, maybe some level of mental influence that they are able to exert. So yes, you can see this element of it as a form of infiltration. And I do think that is a genuine possibility. I also think that there are other, other motivations for abductions that are separate from hybridization. And I go into these in the book. One of them I would just simply characterize as a um, highly sophisticated monitoring operation via implants. I definitely think that is going on. Uh, and not just by the grays. So my book explores current interactions that people are having with these alien entities, including the infamous reptilians and insectoid types of beings, as well as uh, ongoing interactions with bizarre but very human looking beings that just seem alien, but they look human. Now, throughout all of this, believe me, I was well aware of how crazy some of this is going to sound to some readers. I'm quite aware of that. So in that sense, this was not a safe book for me to write since I realized that I have jumped into some wild territory. Still, as I said earlier, I think this is a very useful thing to try. In my view, it comes down to something simple. If we are to acknowledge a genuine UFO phenomenon, right, something that doesn't appear to come from our civilization, this is a conclusion I have come to for years, and it's a conclusion that many, many researchers have come to, obviously, for a long time now. So if we're going to work on that assumption, then it's very important at least to try to get a handle on the likely scenarios of what we're dealing with. That is, who are they and what do they want? It's that simple. So as I state throughout this book, The Alien Agendas, we are at a severe handicap in understanding the answers to a lot of these questions that we want to ask. I mean, first of all, we're dealing with a phenomenon that is inherently very, very difficult for us to grasp. Um, that, that's a really important thing to, to get a hold of here. All right, at least one and, and possibly all of these visitors or these others uh, operate at very advanced levels. And it's just difficult for us to deal with that. That's the reality. Secondly, there is secrecy at all levels of what is going on here, starting with these other beings, as well as our own power establishment, and we all know that. But despite the difficulties, this is important to understand. Like This theme is important, and this is exactly why I wrote this book. Many people don't realize that it's important because, frankly, the problem is kept far, far removed from their daily awareness. We all know this as well. Deep below the surface level of our world, of the ever shrinking number of conversations and opinions that people are allowed to have, there is this nagging problem that is not going to go away no matter how deeply it's buried. So the title of my, my book, The Alien Agendas, on. I use the word agendas rather than agenda. I don't think that we're dealing with one single group. I think that our current state of development has prompted the whole neighborhood, the whole galactic neighborhood to take a look at us. And not 
all of these other beings are necessarily bad or malevolent. And I really want to make this point. There are enough stories of people to this day who have had what they strongly believe are positive encounters with, well, someone, some other beings. And, you know, for a long time, I didn't personally really know what I thought about many of these types of claims. But honestly, there's just too many of them. And I personally cannot find a good reason to dismiss them out of hand. And it's also not illogical that there would be at least one group that has been here uh, for a while and may want to help us. I, I don't think that that's, you know, I, I think that's actually a logical assumption. And it does seem to be supported by an, the evidence of a number of these interactions that people have been having. Um, and maybe the the benevolent group or one of the benevolent groups is the one that's been here all along. I don't know, but there is enough diversity among these other beings that I do think we are looking at multiple groups and agendas. The main thing I think, and which I suggest in this book is that all of these groups are very interested in what we are now about to embark on this transformation. As I've been saying for years, we are about to leap into their world. And I'm quite sure that they know this. Underlying all of this massive untold story is the question of whether this is all a good thing or a bad thing. Well, one of the things that many, not all, but many abductees talk about from their human hybrid handlers is, is about some sort of coming great change. If you go back uh, on this channel and you uh, listen to the interview I did with uh, Dr. David Jacobs from a couple of years ago, he talks quite a bit about this. But a number of people have mentioned this and, and from a number of different abduction researchers, not just David, uh, quite a few abductees have talked about this, that they have heard about this from the, the hubrids or the hybrids that they, that they have interacted with, that there's going to be a great change coming, a great change. No one gives any details. Um, one thing to me that is quite obvious about that is that we are going through this great change right now. This is not necessarily something that the aliens are gonna be causing. It, it could very well, and I think this is the case, something that they knew about and is happening. We're doing the great change right now. And it's not something that's happening overnight, but it is something that's taking place over the course of a couple of generations. It's not that, not that long in the grand scheme of things. It's happening. Our society is moving into something, something totally different that's never existed before. And it's a fair question as to whether or not it's becoming literally anti-human or at least non-human, <laughs> some kind of non-human environment. Um, it is clearly, in my view, becoming disconnected from our natural state of being. So that that is a question we really want to be asking. And I do ask this. But this great change, this is the key, it seems to me. Whether it means that humans will still, you know, maybe there's a, the positive as aspect of it, like uh, we'll all develop higher consciousness and higher intelligence and become peaceful and somehow better. Uh, maybe. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> but uh, Or maybe we're just going to be turning ourselves into one giant anthill. You can reflect on those possibilities yourself. But the, here's the thing, the outcome of this change matters a great deal. And this is why I conclude that one or more of these groups aren't just interested in monitoring and observing this process, but I believe quite possibly trying to manage this outcome. And this can happen through a variety of means. It can happen from quiet and strategic infiltration it can come through some form of control or leverage over that process in any number of ways. Or it could happen in, by other means that I, I haven't even thought about or maybe no one has thought about. It is not hard for me to imagine that some groups would want to control this process that we are going through because it is a very powerful process with tremendous implications. What we are doing here in this transformation um, as scary as it is to many of us, and it scares me, I'm not going to lie about that, but what this process is doing on one level to some people and to some groups is in 
incredibly valuable, like literally something of great intense value. What our civilization is creating in this transformation has value to a number of people because it's it is giving this species, our species, tremendous power that is coming out of this technological and ultimately societal and ultimately biological transformation because genetic engineering is fig figuring into this too. So this is a powerful transition that we are going through. And that means it is potentially dangerous to other groups and it is potentially disruptive to other groups. I'm not persuaded at all by people who say, oh, they're so far ahead of us that they, why could they, why would they want to worry about us at all? I don't believe that. I think what's happening is change doesn't happen on a gradual scale like this. It doesn't just go bit by bit by bit. No, it doesn't work like that. It goes bit by bit and then leaps, bit by bit and leaps and so on. That's what these revolutions are about. That's what these transformations are. So we're in the process of a transformative qualitative leap to something fundamentally different. The transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture wasn't just a little bit more of the same. No, no, that was a dramatic transformation. The transition from an agriculturally based society to science and industry was not just little bits and pieces here and there. No, it was a dramatic transformation, qualitative difference. And that is what we're going through now. And that's gonna take us to a substantially greater level. You think about with strong post-singularity AI, uh, nanotech, uh, you know, the mind boggles at all the ways that these different uh, technologies are gonna be interacting with each other. We, we really cannot imagine this, but it's radically different. And yes, disruptive to anyone out there, uh, which by the way, I have speculations in the book that those societies are very possibly incredibly stable, uh, stable in a way that human societies have never seen any such type of stability. Uh, a, we're biological and our lifespans aren't that long and we have passion and we have ego and we've got all of these other qualities. I don't think that they, these other alien groups operate that like that any longer. My uh, best speculation is that they are probably ruled by a very, very advanced, highly sophisticated uh, set of algorithms. Um, it doesn't mean that they have no agency of their own individually, but the uh, sense that you know comes to me from the uh, people who've had interactions with these beings is that there's a, a very regimented form of society and very likely a very stable, and I'm almost inclined to say ossified type of civilization. And this is all speculation on my part, but this is what I believe is very possibly the case. So yes, they would have a very strong interest in overseeing and potentially managing this process and then you're getting down to a very tricky problem of counterintelligence of this presence. And you know, th these again are issues that I do discuss in the book and they are, they have to be an absolute nightmare for any <clears throat> human groups that are charged with dealing with this. I can only imagine, I can only imagine. Um, doesn't mean that all the groups out there are bad, but, or, seek to control us or do us harm, but it is entirely possible. And one continues to hear the leaks and the rumor mill from within the classified world that this is in fact the case, that there's at least one group that we really have to worry about. So I'm gonna leave it at that. There's, there's much, much more uh, that I discuss about these issues in, in this book. By the way, it's available as a paperback and as an ebook. It will uh, very soon be available as an audio book. I'm very happy and proud about that. Uh, we've got a great audiobook reader who's working on it right now. So I think that will be available, um, um, I think possibly in the second or third week of December, hopefully before Christmas. So you can pick it up before then. Uh, but the ebook and paper book are available right now on Amazon. I have a link below, uh, or you can link directly to my site, richardolanmembers.com, where I've got a link right there at the top of the site that I just put up there. And I'm actually tomorrow, I'll be putting it on my other website, richardolanpress.com. It's not there now, but it will be very soon. 
So again, as I mentioned, I haven't been on YouTube very much recently uh, as I have in the past. This is primarily because I've been doing the book writing, but I just want to emphasize again that if you are interested in work that I am doing, I have remained very active on my website, publishing my weekly video podcast, as well as lots of articles and audio content. Over there, I cover everything to do with not just UFOs, lots of UFO material there, but also the other volatile things going on in this world, including COVID, including the lockdowns. I've had quite a bit of things to say about that. Uh, and of course, of course, the recent presidential election. Uh, if you are interested in those issues or what I have to say about them, you can always check that out over at richardolmembers.com. And by the way, there's a tremendous group of absolutely brilliant people who are subscribers of that site, who provide commentary, and it just, they blow my mind every single day when I read what they have to say. And in, in a kicking forum too, by the way, an awesome uh, closed forum that doesn't get overrun by trolls because we have moderators and it's a closed group and it's it's fabulous. So anyway, I'm sure I will, will pick up on my YouTube content at some point, it's not done. Uh, but meanwhile, you can find me very active over at my site. I guess I can mention one more thing. As soon as I finished completing my book a couple of weeks ago, I started doing something else. And that is to, to engage in a serious jumpstart or re jumpstart, I guess I should say, back into the project that has been sitting in the waiting room for 10 years. And that is volume three of UFOs in the National Security State. Um, I'm surprised at how much I'm getting done. I, I've been reviewing the massive data that I've already had, which thank God there was a lot of it that I've already done. Um, and now I'm just very happily going through more research to get everything else ready for this book. Uh, this is That's the next book that I'm going to, to publish. It will be volume three of UFOs in a National Security State. I'm not letting any other projects get in the way of it at this time. So, um, I don't usually get ex I don't easily get excited on projects that I'm engaged in, but I actually feel a little bit of excitement about this. I'm very happy to be going into it, uh, and I have no doubt that I'll be giving updates on that project at least over at my site. And if I get a chance, I'll do it here on YouTube as well. So that's pretty much all of everything I've got here. I just want to say one more thing, which is that through all of this difficult time in our world's history and in, in our nation's history, if you're in the United States, but really wherever you are. Um, I wanna thank everyone who has continued to support the work I do. Tracy and I remain very grateful for the friendships and for the goodwill that so many of you have graced us with. And I just wanna thank you all personally for that. And that's it. Thanks for being here with me. I will catch you again sometime soon. And let's just all remember, keep fighting the good fight. Later.